I'll open it again. I now open the Thursday, April 12th, 2020 uh, school committee meeting here at the uh, COVID school. Uh, we had a roll call, as to, I believe everyone is here. Uh, thank you for the people that are tuning in. Uh, I can assure you this is high drama. Um, we'll go with uh, an order called order. Routine matters A will be the approval of the minutes for our open session, March 26, 2020. I'll entertain a motion to accept. So moved. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. 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 Okay. Uh, roll call vote. Ms. Dolan? Aye. Mr. Chase? Aye. Ms. Lemaire? Aye. Ms. Soros? Aye. Mr. Kokoros? Aye. The chair votes aye. Mr. Mayor, you can text it if you have to. Aye. Okay, yeah. Great. Right, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, moving on. B will be communications and accommodations. Uh, Mr. Hackett, please. We do not have anything this evening. So uh -huh. I'll set. Excellent. Moving on to part three, which will be from the superintendent and staff. So Mr. Uh, Chairman. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I had a communication, if that's okay. By all means, please. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, uh, reach out to the group and, and say thank you to uh, Ms. Lemire. Um, we've got uh, this great community task force working out there, which she's a member of, and uh, have gotten some great uh, feedback from different residents on her efforts to uh, help uh, deliver uh, food and other things uh, to our neighbors. I just want to uh, thank her very much. Um, doing a great job. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Ms. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor and Ms. Lemaire, for uh, right. helping us in what we call the difficult time. <coughs> Mr. Hackett, uh, Dr. Hackett, excuse me. So uh, you have up on your screen, as you know, we went out to bid this year for a three-year lease on our uh, small passenger buses. It was a lease uh, the uh, RFP um, was for a lease of 10. 26 to 29 passenger buses, and six 18 passenger, one being wheelchair equipped uh, with air conditioning. So um, we have a three-year lease, <clears throat> estimated mileage was 50, 15,000 per, per year. And we had two bidders. The opening happened on Wednesday, this past Wednesday on the 1st. Winning bet, bid went to Statico at 450,036, which is $150,000 a year approximately. Um, and which is good news for us because our, the, the expiring lease is actually costing us 142 dollars So we had budget for a little bit more than that. Um, and, you know, that's, a, that's good news for the budget moving forward. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, with our, excuse me, any other uh, comments or questions out there, please? No. Okay, hearing none, I do have a few comments or questions. Um, with our present economic situation, do you think that if we tabled this, we would get better numbers or worse? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Based on the economic situations, um, is this considered a, a single night action? This um, you can take it. It's a next meeting if you want to. Um, just given the time frame in terms of how many more meetings we're going to have, yeah. availability, everything that's going on. Uh, if you're comfortable with uh, taking it as a single night action, it's up to you, though. Well, what usually happens with signal, single night actions, I'll explain to everyone. Uh, we normally don't do that. Um, we can do it. It's within our power to do so. But as the chair, what I ask is, I ask, is there anyone that has an objection to moving on to this in a single night action? If someone has an objection, it means it must be put off to the next meeting. I will ask right now, does anyone have a problem with a single light action with this? I'll take that as I'm hearing none. Um, so any other comments or questions? Yeah, motion. All right, great. I'll entertain a motion to accept this, uh, this contract. Motion to accept. Second. I have a motion uh, by Mr. Kokoros. I have a second by Mr. Chafe. Ms. Dolan? Aye. Mr. Chase? Aye. Ms. Lemaire? Aye. Ms. Soros? Aye. Mr. Mayor? Aye. 
Mr. Kokoris. Aye. And the chair votes aye. It passes unanimously. Okay, thank you, Ron. Everybody, next. So uh, this evening I've asked uh, Rebecca Kidwell, who's the Director of Technology and Accountability, to talk to us about learning the learning platforms and access. As you know, we're moving, uh, taking the next step, given the governor's recent uh, order for us to be closed till May 4th and the commissioner's uh, Department of Education's recent guidance on this topic. Uh, we are taking the action to move forward to a more structured um, form of uh, remote learning. Uh, that will be part, that's part of the agenda tonight too, but uh, before we can get there, obviously, it's a technology base. We wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing and uh, how we're supporting the learning uh, with our technology. So, Ms. Kidwell? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Hi, great to be here this evening. Um, I hope everybody is comfortable and safe at home on this rainy night. Um, so, the first slide we have here talks about the goals of remote teaching and learning, right? Because in this time, obviously, um, even in the communication that's coming from the State Department of Education is talking about how the top priority is the safety and the well being of our students and their families and our staff. Um, but part of that can be remote teaching and learning, uh, where we maintain a connection when we're apart. Uh, maintain some level of routine and normalcy for students who are accustomed to being in school, seeing their teachers, maybe collaborating with uh, peers on assignments. And then uh, again, emphasizing the support, safety, and well being of our community as a whole through this time. So while we want to do all of those things, we're suddenly faced with the challenge of um, doing this from you know, several thousand different homes across town. So some of the technology challenges of remote teaching include teachers access to devices. Um, many of our teachers do have uh, comfortable device access at home uh, because much of their workload goes home with them, uh, whether they want it to or not. But um, some of our teachers do not. And um, some of our teachers have uh, spouse or other family members who have recently come home from college for online learning and um, device access can be difficult. So uh, one of the challenges that we've been dealing with is making sure all staff have access to a device that will let them provide um, remote teaching. Another challenge is the staff's knowledge of online teaching platforms and resources, because on a daily basis, when we're able to be together in school, we certainly aren't spending the entire, um, you know, seven hour, seven and a half hour school day on screens. As students get older, um, they, oh, can you take me back one slide? Thank you. Bye. Thanks. No worries. Um, as the students get older, they certainly do more with online teaching and learning platforms, but especially for our youngest learners, pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, not a lot of that time is spent in front of a screen. And um, now we're suddenly, as, in, as educators, ramping up how we can best work with um, our youngest kids, our neediest learners as far as educational support uh, in these online settings. So where we don't already have a platform in place, selecting reputable resources is a real challenge for teachers. And I'm sure all of you as parents and community members um, and other educators who are on the line have seen a million uh, emails just flooding your inbox of how every service is suddenly free and they just want to support us in this time of need. Uh, and that's uh, great and, you know, certainly has a, a, a strain of charity in it. Um, but it would be naive to think that all these companies are truly doing it out of charitable purpose. In most cases, they're, uh, and, and this goes to the next bullet, their data policies allow them to access um, potential information about students. They could allow access to things like other places students have been in their browser, other tabs that are open while students are logging in. Um, and we want to be really careful that as we've taken all of this online learning to students' homes, we're protecting students, we're protecting families' technology. Um, we don't want to uh, expose your uh, home technology setup or your student to anything that um, would be detrimental. So uh, as teachers, we have to be really cautious about what we're choosing. And you know, one uh, example of this is there are definitely neighboring communities who are using um, live video conferencing with students. 
And we've chosen not to do that for a couple of reasons. Um, one is uh, that we've, well, the, the primary reason is we haven't been able to find any platform, including Zoom. Oh, hello. Gotcha. Thank Lydia. you. Uh, <laughs> so um, including Zoom, including Google Hangouts Meet, um, including, uh, you know, Facebook Live, Instagram, all of these options where you could possibly be uh, live with students, all of them have serious privacy concerns. Um, even if you read the, uh, the privacy policy and they say that they're keeping your data private, I promise you that tech directors across the country are on a large scale listserv working with these companies talking with the companies about the problems that we've seen. And I, you may have seen some of them in the news. Um, there are a couple of states that are actually suing some of these video conferencing companies right now. There was uh, some news that came out of a neighboring town recently about an inappropriate incident that happened where someone hacked the, the um, video conferencing feed with a class. There was an advisory recently from the FBI Boston about uh, what could be serious concerns about using these platforms. So. Uh, we're working with teachers right now to build other safer ways that we can still have um, visual connection with students, whether it's the teacher making a video and posting that video in a safe way that students can then come back to and um, view at any time, whenever fits their schedule, uh, whether it's um, students through, uh, through email or through a principal with parent permission, sharing photos of their work or photos of, you know, uh, how they're interacting with the lesson. Uh, we're looking at ways to make sure that there is still that human connection and that it's not only, um, you know, type things back and forth all the time, but we just wanna be really sure that we do it safely. So that's the teaching side. There are also challenges to remote learning, which I'm sure many families are already starting to consider at home. One is student device access. And uh, when we get to the next slide, that will talk about how we're trying to address issues with that. Um, Another is the availability of tech support in a home setting, right? At school, we have um, a tech department, we have teachers in every building who have some technical capacity, but at home, especially in this time, uh, if there's not a family member who's really comfortable uh, with supporting a student, that could be a challenge for some families. Student data privacy is a challenge for families as well, because as families look through the resources that we offer and run across ads and links and start to see other free things that they hear other districts are doing, I would just encourage parents to be really cautious about where you make an account that reveals your student's name and birth date and what the privacy policy of that platform actually says. Again, there's a lot of places out here that are offering something for free and it's very rarely truly free. The last challenge for remote learning is that as a district that accepts federal funding under the E-rate program, we're required to filter the internet um, under federal law. And the federal law involved here is called CIPA, the Children's Internet Protection Act. As we provide internet service to families who do not currently have internet service, the tech department has been investigating ways that we can filter the internet on those hotspots that we've provided so that we're not potentially bringing um, unsafe internet into a family's home. And when we create accounts for students that they use, and when we give out devices from the school, all of those have some level of filtering and protections to try to prevent um, students from getting into unsafe situations online. Next slide, please. Great. So the biggest thing we're, we've been working on this week, and we have one more day of this tomorrow, is distributing uh, Chromebooks and, if we're needed, internet access to families in need. Uh, principals have been coordinating this with their buildings, reaching out to families that have a need, identifying those families, uh, helping us put together a list to determine how many devices we need to prepare. We've done two days of pickups already uh, across um, three sites so far, the high school, east and south. So far, it's actually, as of this afternoon, over 150 Chromebooks have been distributed. And in addition, the school department has been providing AT&T internet hotspots to families who don't have internet access. Um, the remaining pickup opportunities are tomorrow morning at Ross to coincide with the food grab and go, uh, which could mean that it's a little bit crowded there this morning. Tomorrow morning, tech services will be down at the far end of the building. Um, 
when you first pull in the drive, uh, it'll be food first, Chromebook second. So there'll be some room to pull in at the parking lot down there if you need to pick up a device. Tomorrow afternoon, we'll also be at South. In both cases, it's a drive up situation. Um, you don't even need to get out of your car, uh, but you do need to contact your child's teacher or principal before you show up at these um, settings, just so we can try to make sure we're well prepared with enough devices to hand out. As the distribution completes uh, tomorrow, teachers will begin reaching out to students and families with academic materials and supports in the week to come. That's it for me. You. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Do we have any uh, comments or questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair. By all means, George. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. This is George Kokoris. Thanks for the update. Um, couple, of, couple of questions, comments. Um, I think two of the things that are concerning parents the most is I think the first thing is just structure around learning. So obviously the last few weeks there has, you know, the, the whole schedule of getting up in the morning, getting ready for school and having some structure has kind of gone out the window, right? Um, so I think that's one of the concerns about how are we going to implement that with a remote learning platform. And then I guess the second comment or question is, are, are we going to figure out a platform? I mean, you didn't mention Skype. I know that's another one that um, is widely used. Or is there a way that we can somehow build um, a platform internally in our network yeah. that would accommodate it? Sure. So actually, Jim Lee on the next two slides is going to get to um, both of your questions. So without stealing his thunder, I'll just say absolutely we have some platforms that allow teachers and students and families to communicate asynchronously, um, meaning the students don't have to be online at a particular time slot. And that should allow families to structure the learning day the way that works best for their family schedule. Obviously, in this time of crisis, we have a lot of families who are doing shift work, whether it's as a first responder or as someone working in a grocery store or pharmacy setting. Um, so we, we don't want to create a situation where we're saying, everybody be there at 9 a.m. It's time for school to start um, because we're not able to open a building and welcome them in at 9 a.m. Uh, but we do want to uh, create some um, structure in lessons and assignments for families who are seeking that. So Jim's going to talk about that on the next two slides. Excellent. And I just want to commend you for, I know this has been a lot of work over the last couple of weeks and you and your team working with uh, administration have done a great job to pull this all together. So thank, thank you. you. We appreciate that. Any other comments or questions from the uh, committee? I just, this is Carla Saros. I just want Carly. to thank you. Um, I definitely know my kids need some kind of connection with their teachers that we've kind of lost in the last few weeks. We plug away as much as we can the work we have. Am I hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, sorry. No, I just saying I appreciate it. We definitely need that connection with the teachers. Absolutely, Carla. I can tell you the teachers are looking forward to um, getting back to some uh, closer connections with students and families as well. Any other comments or questions? I, thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, thank we, you. Where are we on our, uh, are we looking at? So if, if, what, Mr. Mayor, are you? What's that? Okay, I thought you might have, I thought I heard you. Uh, no, no, oh. I'm, I'm on mute right now. <laughs> I can still hear you. <laughs> um, I'm going to mute right now. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Just from a flow standpoint, if uh, it's okay with everybody, we'll just roll into the, uh, to give you an update on distance learning, the distance learning plan. And with that is Assistant Superintendent uh, Jim Lee. Okay, thank you very much. And um, good to speak to everybody. Uh, to piggyback on a lot of what Rebecca said, uh, one of the pieces that we have been working on is trying to ensure that the plan that we develop engages all of the students within the district, and that's been the challenge. Um, you know, technology access is not readily available to all of the families in Braintree, and it has been a process uh, seeking out and identifying 
those families that need a device or internet capacity. Uh, and Rebecca and her team working with the building principals has done an excellent job thus far getting to that core group of people who are, are the ones in most need of support around technology. Uh, as you remember, when the governor first shut down schools until April 6th, uh, the direction from DESE uh, was really about providing enrichment opportunities for students that were voluntary, that would not count towards grading, uh, and that would keep kids engaged with the hope that we'd be back in school on the 6th. In that time, our teachers have been working on professional development um, to prepare for the return of kids and to accomplish some other uh, learning needs that they themselves had as we prepare to get through the rest of the year. But obviously that situation has changed now that the schools are scheduled to be closed until at least May 4th. So the, the plan that we would be rolling out beginning next week uh, is a culmination of a lot of work done by not only the directors, the principals, but also in collaboration with the union to make sure that it is a plan that we think all think is viable uh, in the best interest of students given the circumstances that we confront today. So if you look up on the slide, uh, at the elementary schools, um, lessons and units will be delivered by grade level and uh, collaboration will be done by grade level within each building to make sure that teachers are on the same page, uh, focused on similar content to deliver to students. Uh, directors are working with building principals to identify what we call power standards, which are really the most crucial elements that we want kids to take away from a, their time in, in a particular grade and to focus on those power standards and the lessons that they create and distribute during this closure time. Uh, beginning on the 6th, uh, directors will be still the ones putting out the academic lessons to students. And this is to allow our teachers time to ramp up, not only in terms of making initial contact with families, kind of reintroducing themselves, if you will, but also to familiarize themselves with the platforms we will be using to distribute materials and to have an opportunity to do some of that co-planning with their peers to make sure that by the time that they're delivering the lessons to students, there is the coherency that we want to see. So for the first uh, week and a day or so, because uh, next week also includes Good Friday, uh, academic directors will be providing the lessons to students uh, by grade level, but beginning on April 15th, it'll be the teachers by grade level who will be distributing those lessons. Uh, what we found at the elementary level is that we already were using uh, extensively, but not completely, a number of different uh, academic programs or platforms that teachers use to communicate information back and forth with students and families. The, the three at the elementary level include Class Dojo, uh, a software called Blooms, and another called Google Classroom, which uh, if you have kids in the secondary level, you're probably more familiar with. Uh, by site, meaning by building, the, a determination will be made about the platform that the teachers want to use to get information out to kids. Uh, we also need to do a little professional development around some teachers who may not have been using a particular platform up until this point in time. We believe we can have that up and running by the end of next week. Uh, the intent is to provide uh, a five days worth of lessons to parents starting each Wednesday. Uh, we pick Wednesday because we believe it allows families more flexibility in terms of when the work can get accomplished. Uh, everybody's schedule is off kilter at this point. Uh, you have several people in the homes typically who need access to the technology that's available there. So a schedule that allows maximum flexibility for when the work is done is what we were shooting for. The Wednesday to Wednesday allows the weekend to play a role in that uh, and to allow greater flexibility for parents and families to figure out when the work can be done and when they might be available to help support their students. Uh, Rebecca used the term uh, asynchronously, which is a great word only because it saves you a lot of other words if you try to explain it differently, but it really means that not everybody has to be doing the same thing at the same time. So English for a fourth grader doesn't happen on Thursday at 9 o'clock. It happens when that family is prepared to sit down and do the English work. We would be asking students and families to submit work back to teachers uh, on a weekly basis, the focus being on English language arts and math at the elementary level. Uh, and students would receive feedback from teachers on those particular assignments. 
The other piece, as Rebecca had mentioned, that we really want to emphasize is connection with the school. And as a result, teachers will be reaching out to families at least once a week to continue those connections and to make sure the kids stay engaged. At the upper grade levels, it looked a little bit differently only because uh, online learning platforms are not unfamiliar to that group. Academic lessons and materials will basically be provided to students and families through Google Classroom, which again is a format that most of those grades are used to and students have been working within almost in the entire year. These lessons, unlike elementary, will begin being distributed by teachers as of next Wednesday, April 8th. And again, we'll run on a very similar Wednesday to Wednesday schedule with the same rationale in mind that it's maximum flexibility in terms of when the work can get done. Teachers will be in communication with families, making sure the kids comprehend the work, but also making sure that the kids are engaged enough to be doing the work. We don't want to lose any students who may feel that this is still voluntary or for whatever the reason are not participating in the education that is being provided. And teachers will attempt to communicate with families around that. If they are unsuccessful, they will alert building administration and guidance to continue the, that outreach to make sure that all kids stay engaged in their education during this period of time. Similar to the elementary schools, teachers will be uh, requesting back only targeted assignments. Very, the, the most important assignments that they give out during the five week span and they will provide students with feedback on those assignments to further the learning of students and to make sure that the direction that students are taking is appropriate. At those levels as well, guidance and support services will also be in communication with families, not only to keep them engaged, but to support them in their learning and in these difficult times. Some of the social emotional pieces that a lot of families in town are dealing with is very much on our minds and we have staff that can help outreach to families and connect them to whatever services might be necessary. Rangey High School, unlike all the other levels, will be reporting out some type of grading on a credit, no credit basis. It's not an A, it's not a B, it's not a C. You either get credit or you do not get credit. This is important at the high school level because in order to graduate from Braintree High School, you must accumulate a certain number of credits in order to receive a diploma. So this process will allow students to still work towards achieving those credits that they need towards graduation. Uh, it would also trigger, in the, for, in the case of those kids who would receive no credit, more support being provided to those families and students to make sure that every effort is expended to ensure that they graduate on time. Just in terms of support services that are available throughout the district regardless of level, our special education case managers and related service providers will also be informing parents on a weekly basis how they are delivering the services that those students are entitled to. Our ELL students will receive not only the lessons that they get from their regular education teachers, but they will also get supplementary lessons from our ELE staff uh, and support with, from that staff as needed to complete their work. Uh, ELE teachers will also be communicating with families as, as we go. Uh, they have access to an online, um, I'm sorry, on the phone translation service, which will allow them to communicate with families where that language barrier exists. In all cases, our support services will be in online collaboration with uh, regular classrooms and buildings to make sure that all the supports necessary for individual students and families to be successful is being provided to the best extent possible. And that's a really fast explanation of our plan to implement starting next Monday uh, and rolling out from there. But I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions from the committee? No. Nope. Uh, this is Jen Dolan. I'd just like to say thank you so much to everybody who put all the work into making this. Um, it's such a thoughtful um inclusive plan and i think it supports not only parents and children but also recognizes and respects um the fact that teachers are people too and you know are dealing with their own um home situations as we all are so i'm looking forward to this rolling out and just wanted to say thanks for all the effort thank you hi okay, thank you, any other uh, comments or questions um this is kelly hi um I have a couple questions. Can you hear me? By all means. Uh, can you hear me? 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, thanks for the update. I think this is very helpful. I agree with what George said at the beginning that um, I think as a parent, we're all looking for some kind of structure for the kids. I know I feel like my kids are sleeping um, all day and up all night and, um, and I'm not, I'm on the opposite schedule. So I, I agree that it would, I'm looking forward to some kind of um, structure. And one of the things I did notice is, you know, kids will put off doing things, um, you know, they, they keep coming, oh, well, this is optional, this is optional, this is optional. So it would be great to see things that, you know, um, even if they're not graded and you said credit, that's great because I think it's important for the kids to do things and feel like they don't just have to do things that, you know, they're going to get graded on. And um, so I, I look forward to that. Um, I also have a, a question that, um, you know, in, in reality, um, are we preparing for the long term? Because, you know, I don't want to say this out loud, but what if we don't go back to school at all this year? And, you know, I think, you know, will we be, what, what happens to the kids' grades? I mean, how do you make up for semesters and, and that kind of stuff? So I'm really wishing you didn't ask that question because the contemplation of that question uh, is a little chilling. We obviously are, and this, I'm sorry, this is Superintendent Frank Hackett. Um, you know, we're having those conversations. We have this structure will allow, would allow for long-term um, distance virtual learning to continue. Uh, so we are in good shape, uh, it will be in good shape uh, for, from that perspective. The questions around credit and how we factor in pre, prior grades, GPA at the high school, uh, those are discussions that we're having now. Uh, we are still obviously awaiting guidance from the Department of Education on, on those items as well. Um, there's a lot of conversation about different ways that, that we might be able to do that, but uh, hopefully we still have several weeks to um, consider those issues. We will be discussing them and we'll be ready to go uh, if, in fact, the, um, the closure gets extended by the, by the governor. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, it, this is George Kokoros. By all means, Mr. Kokoros, please. Yeah, and just, uh, you know, and I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I believe we have some of our student reps on the phone. So maybe they could give us a little bit of an update on um, how they feel about this and maybe what's been happening over the last couple of weeks. Oh, hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes, we got Hey, John. Hello. Thanks, John. I just have a quick question about the current grades that are in Aspen right now. So we have grades in Aspen's for, for Braintree High School for two terms, term one and two. How will the grades from these online assignments factor into the grades throughout the entire year? That's a great question, John. Um, at this point, I can't give you a concrete answer because some of it would be dependent upon whether or not the closure gets extended. Um, right now, we know those grades exist. They are concrete numbers that we can work off of. What we really don't know yet is how long a credit, no credit scenario would play out. And based on that, how much we would look to either wait those first quarter grades that you mentioned or the year in its totality giving some weight to the credit, no credit element. So it is something we've been talking about extensively, but it's an unknown only because what I can't tell you at this moment whether or not the school year will still be extended. Closure extended. Does that answer your question, John? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, comments or questions? Uh, I do just wanted to share, I know that there's been, we've received some calls and some emails with just questions around what uh, is happening around us. Um, and I think there's been, there's some misinformation and certainly there's some school systems that are farther ahead than we are for a variety of reasons. Um, there are certain school systems that have had some infrastructure in place around remote learning for a longer period of time. I just remind everybody that we just had wireless internet access installed in our building five years ago uh, through a state grant. Um, and we've been ramping up our technology department, including our device availability over the last five years to the tune of two or $300,000 a year. Um, so we definitely started from a point of, um, of a little bit of catch up uh, or we are behind from the standpoint of some other school systems that um, have really kind of came out of the gate early with uh, more structured learning opportunities. But, you know, I also think that 
just based on the guidance that's coming out of the Department of Education, particularly around how do we service students with uh, special needs and how do we service students who, for whom English is not their first language. Um, you know, I'm sure they have that figured out, uh, but, you know, we do have a significant population of kids that uh, need to have uh, those supports put in place. Uh, that was probably the heaviest lift for us in, in a lot of ways. Uh, because certainly our curriculum is established and, and ready to go. I do want to thank, along with Assistant Superintendent Lee, I want to make sure we thank the, the directors and the principals who uh, have been on this and, and working on this for uh, weeks now. So uh, the plan we put in front of you, I, I, we feel very good about. I think it's well thought through. I think we also have learned from some of the mistakes that other people have um, unfortunately kind of stumbled into just because it's just so new. But I, I did have on this slide, just wanted to show you three communications from area schools uh, that came out. Uh, this is right off their website, so if anyone wants to uh, go to the websites and, and check. But as you can see, uh, March 25th, Milton um, put out a communication about the same time we did. And to, to be candid, we, you know, Milton and Quincy, both the superintendents of those two communities uh, are in pretty, pretty regular communication with me. We have a lot of similarities in terms of population and our proximity to Boston. So uh, we've been in close discussion on uh, how we're going to roll these things out. So um, Milton um, uh, is talking about the beginning of April, going into a more structured uh, learning platform as we discussed this evening. You see that Quincy uh, will be launching that uh, on Monday, April 6th as well, along with us. Um, and then Hingham, um, which is um, – obviously not quite as close to Boston in terms of location on the coast, a little more connected to the South Shore, but this is from March 31st, which would have been Wednesday, uh, communication from the superintendent that they're in the final stages of remote learning planning development, uh, and they're going to attach that pl plan and send it out later in the week. So presumably they'll also be on schedule to roll out their uh, more direct instruction remote learning plan next week as well. So I just thought just because the questions have been out there, that's just three examples. And I'm, I, I found others, Weston, for example, that I think before they even closed the door on the first day out, they were uh, locked and loaded on uh, having a remote learning in place, um, a little bit of a demogra different demographic than us and a little bit of a different financial picture than, than we have here in Braintree. So uh, I did think that was worth sharing with you. I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Any comments or questions? I have a comment. Um, look, we have looked at the state, the DOE, for some types of guidance, and, and they are trying to give us what they can. But let's remember, uh, a lot of this, there are some gaps, and uh, I'm proud of each and every person that you know works for our district, from us on the school committee down to uh, our, all of our employees. And the fact that they've taken this to heart and they're, they're working diligently to provide the best educational experience we can for our students. Um, but there again, you know, you, you can see a, a, as you look and you listen to the, the nightly news that all different districts are making quite a bit of this, you know, up on the fly. The decisions we're making are sometimes on an hourly basis, but we are making them. Um, I believe that we have the right people at the right places at the right time to each person, uh, to, to the person that we are making strides and we will improve on this. Uh, the first week, you know, uh, will be one way. The second week, as we get the learning curve, you know, uh, shall we say worked out, we'll, we'll do better. So I guess in a, in a long-winded way, thank you everyone for helping us in, this, in these times of needs. Um, Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hackett, next uh, item, final item. Uh, under uh, our report tonight. As you remember, last, uh, last meeting we brought to you the recommendation that had been vetted by the uh, uh, Finance and Operations Subcommittee to move forward with our original plan of, uh, of housing grades 5 through 8 at East Mill School for uh, Flaherty, uh, Hollis, Flaherty, Morrison, and Ross for next school year. This, uh, again, was the original submission and the approved plan by the MSBA. Um, East is uh, making very good progress. We don't anticipate any problems with uh, the building being ready to enter in the fall of 2020 from a, from a facility standpoint. Uh, we discussed prior to this the uh, possibility of 
of holding on the decision about that until we knew for sure what the South Middle School vote was going to, um, what direction that was going to send us. And that vote, when it was on March 28th, we would have had time and did have time and had talked about a couple of different <laughs> options that were not to pass. Uh, did a lot of work within the community, going to PTOs to des describe the, the process and the plan. Um, and if that vote had, had taken place on the 28th, then we would have had time to make some adjustments if it had not passed. Obviously, um, for all the good reasons and right reasons, the vote, um, the mayor, um, we moved the vote. Uh, we asked for the extension um, the, to a date to be determined, presumably uh, probably in June. Uh, not to, I'm not sure when the date will be finalized, but that does, just from the standpoint of planning, put us in a very different position. Uh, given the fact that fiscal year ends June 30, there are certainly a lot of unknowns going into next year in the fiscal year from the revenue picture, given the uh, COVID-19 shutdown and the impact on both uh, state and local businesses. So there's a lot of uh, moving parts right now that we don't have a lot of answers to as we build out our budgets. Um, and what we are now proposing and discussed at the last meeting was we need to make a decision to proceed uh, with the grade five through eight from Hollis, Flaherty, Morrison, and Ross at East Middle School to <laughs> next year. Uh, with that decision in place, we can notify the staff that we've already told would be going to East. Uh, we can continue our planning process. Our transportation consultant is near completion on uh, figuring out the transportation routes for that to happen. Uh, and we uh, also, I think in this time where there's so much uncertainty, to be able to let parents and students know that we are committed to this direction um, is just the right thing to do to give them certainly one thing to be able to, to kind of count on. Um, if, if in fact, uh, if South passes, that's, uh, that's great and we move forward. Uh, if South does not pass at the next vote, this plan still buys us a year, all of next year, to make decisions about what we might need to do to adjust. Keeping in mind that the students who will be in five through eight next year would then just be in grades six through eight the following year at FY22. So in one of the scenarios, we talked about the possibility of, of East becoming the district-wide six through eight middle school if South were not passed. Um, you know, the good news is that the students we, we have there next year going into the following year would just remain. And then it would be a question of um, uh, redistricting and, and um, students who are currently at South and who will be at South and FY22 uh, into East uh, 6 through 8. And again, that was just one option of several that were discussed. And just pointing it out because it's, I think it's important from a transition standpoint that we, we are providing stability to the students who are going to be there and their families. I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. We would like you to take action on this uh, tonight as a formal of vote of approval. Any uh, questions or comments towards the uh, uh, report given on the East Middle School grades five to eight? Um, this is Kelly. Sorry, um, Dr. Hagnett. You said the um, the debt exclusion vote will be postponed, but we're not sure when it will be postponed. Till is that correct? I do. I, I know there is not a date yet. No. Okay, and we have to make a decision before there will be a vote. Is that what you're saying? In order to get this in, ready for the fall. Yes. Okay. okay. Any other uh, comments or questions? Hearing none, I will uh, entertain a motion to approve this plan. So, so moved. Oh, second. I, I, have, I have a motion by Mr. Chafe. I have a second by Mr. Kokoris. Roll call vote. Ms. Dolan, please. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Chafe. Aye. Ms. LaMare. Aye. Ms. Soros? Aye. Mr. Mayor? Aye. Mr. DeCoris? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is unanimous. Thank, um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for the work you've put in. Moving on to action item four from the school committee. A, uh, school committee student representative updates. Do any of the student reps have anything they'd like to say or bring us up to speed on? What have you been doing, everybody? Well, John spoke. Come on. Hey. How many of you are sleeping until noon? That's really the question. Uh, video games. Video games. Aye. Well, <laughs> aye. Okay. Aye. Uh, I wasn't 
wasn't for the school committee members. It was for the. Oops. Um, I don't have any comment from the student reps. We will go to B. School building committee update. <laughs> the school building committee met. Was it yesterday? Was it yesterday or day before? Yesterday. Well, every day seems the same now. Groundhog Day. At any rate, we met um, uh, remotely. Uh, going over where we are with the East project, we're progressing. Um, I think some of the situations are in that because the Boston market has been shut down that we're getting con more construction people coming over to the East project. They, they are observing social distancing. They're also safe work practices with uh, multiple hand wash stations and whatnot. So with this brave new world we now exist in, they're uh, uh, observing those types of uh, safety precautions. Um, the predominance of the meeting were going over some of the change orders. I believe all change orders were somewhere in the neighborhood of $250,000 that were taken out of either the owner's contingency or the building contingency with the predominance of those being taken from the, the contractor's contingency. So. Financially, we're in a good place. Um, Scheduling-wise, we're, I believe, where we need to be. Um, and it wasn't a long meeting, and uh, I believe that's uh, everything that happened. Can you, uh, big summary, oh. doctor, your thoughts? That's a good summary. Okay. Um, action item uh, 4C, Finance and Operations Subcommittee update. Mr. Kouros, as Thank the chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the budget subcommittee finance and operations, I'm, I'm dating myself here, met earlier this evening and we continue to work on the fiscal year 21 budget. So as everyone knows, and we've heard multiple times this evening, the situation that's happening, you know, right now is very fluid. So we would be in a much different place with the budget and with our discussions, but we have to continue to look at options and strategies and contingency plans, which is what we will do over the next few weeks while we figure out, um, you know, as this situation evolves, how we can best address the budget going forward. So we did, um, as we just voted on earlier, we did recommend moving forward with at least the East Middle School plan at this point, so we can have some semblance of normalcy, at least um, in, in that part of our plan that had been developed for a while. And then we're going to continue to meet um, and we'll just, you know, follow the latest updates on revenue and funding. Obviously, there's a federal stimulus package. We don't know how that will directly affect us. Um, there's obviously issues with revenues at this point that we need to continue to monitor. So we're doing all that we can to address that and manage things um, as they progress. And then on the operation side, we did get an update that um, the buildings, um, while we're not occupying them, will be thoroughly cleaned and prepared for whatever date that um, we're allowed to return to school. So um, we appreciate that effort and uh, that's kind of where we're at at this point. Okay, I, I would only add that, look, uh, the people on the finance committee uh, were always checking in and out with each other. Obviously, myself and the uh, good doctor are talking, uh, you know, at least every other day. I feel for him taking my calls. Um, and we are monitoring the situation, you know, daily, hourly, uh, taking our cues from others, but they're again leading when we have to. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Kokoris because I speak to him daily as far as where he is and what we what our plans are going forward so that we can keep things as normal as possible and yet still, shall we say, meet these challenges, and we are. So, uh, Mr. Kouros, thank you very much for your, your diligence and, and, and your willingness to work and your flexibility. Thank you. Just a reminder on the public comment uh, section of the agenda there, uh, you can reach us um, by phone at um, 781 380 0130. You can also send us any questions or comments you have to our central office email, which is centraloffice at braintree.org. 
Um, those are both, uh, both those pieces of information are listed on our website at uh, BrentreeSchools.org. Do we have any other public comment from anyone that's out there? On the committee? On the committee? Well, anyone, actually. It's public comment, isn't it? No? Okay. Never mind. My bad. Um, any comments from other members of the school committee? Just one quick thing. This is George Kokoris. I think we've said it, but we really do appreciate the efforts of all the administration and staff and the patients as we kind of work through this. So, you know, again, thank you everyone for managing this situation and, and you know, doing the best we can to get and continue learning and do the things that we need to do to keep the school system operating and running. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Okay, uh, I believe we've got through our agenda action points. Uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Ooh. I have a motion by Mr. Chave. Do I have a second? Second. By Mr. Kikoris. Ms. Dolan? Aye. Mr. Chave? Aye. Ms. Lamea? Aye. Ms. Soros? Aye. Mr. Mayor? Aye. Mr. Kikoris? Aye. And the chair both sides. Thank you very much, people. We are now adjourned.